Jen. Welcome everybody to our 2024 Friends Faculty Fellowship. Um, well, lecture the first the first of our two faculty, friends faculty fellowship talks for this year. Um, this year, our friends faculty fellow is Nora Gilbert. Um, and just to to give a little background on this um, on this event and this fellowship. Um, last year, we decided that it would be really lovely if, in addition to um, you know bringing faculty to our Dickens universe every year and having some faculty talking at our um, at our monthly book group, the Pickwick Club, we thought it would be really lovely to be able to ha also have a forum for Dickens Project faculty to be able to introduce our community to the different kinds of work they're doing. Some some of which is about Dickens, most of which isn't about Dickens, most of which focuses on on different aspects of the 19th century. To to just kind of allow everybody to see the the really exciting breadth of work that is happening in in the world of the Dickens Project, and so. Um, Last year we had um, we had two fellows who shared their work, Grace Moore and Deanna Creasel. And this year Nora Gilbert is going to be the one who is sharing her work with us. So today's talk is going to be um, a talk about a, a recent book that she um, that she has co-edited. And then um, our second event, which is going to happen in May, is going to be a, a less formal discussion seminar about um about a movie called Gaslighting. So I'm gonna introduce Nora and then I'm gonna turn things over to her. Um, our session has plenty of time for questions afterwards. So so we'll be really happy to, um, to be able to have a conversation when she's done um, telling us about her work. So Nora Gilbert is an associate professor of English at the University of North Texas. She's the author of Better Left Unsaid, Victorian novels, Hayes Code films, and the benefits of censorship and also the book Gone Girls, 1684 to 1901, Flights of Feminist Resistance in the 18th and 19th century British novel. Um, and that just came out last summer. And she's also the author of a number of other essays on Victorian literature and classical Hollywood film. Since 2017, she served as the editor of the journal Studies in the Novel. Um, she's an excellent karaoke -er, and she's gonna be talking. <laughs> I mean, these are things people should know about you. Um, <laughs> and she's going to be talking to us today about um, an edited collection called Victorian Gaslighting. So um, let's turn things over to Nora. And I just realized, Nora, we didn't talk about how you wanted to do the Q&A at the end. Um, would you prefer, um, usually I think it's probably easiest if we have people use the raise hand function yeah. and then I can call on people or you can call on people. That sounds great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just won't be able to read stuff in the um, the chat while I'm sharing my screen, which I'm going to try to do right now. And let's see if it's as successful as it was before. So what I'm trying to do is get this so that I can see it. You can see the whole thing, but I can see my Word document. So can you see the whole thing? It's like all fill in the screen. Okay, good. So I can read my talk the same time and I'll try to remember to change my own slides. So thank you so much Renee and John and Courtney and the friends of the Dickens Project for this invitation to get to share my work for a really a work in progress. This is, you made it sound like this book is already coming out, but in fact, we're not quite done uh, putting it together yet as I'll talk about um, today. So it's really exciting to get to share this work at this early stage, which we're, my co-editors and I are really, really excited about. So I thought to start off, I would, I always like to hear kind of the origin story of how people come up with their book projects and just their research in general. So I thought I would do that um, to explain how I how I got so obsessed with gaslighting and Victorian gaslighting in particular. And I thought I'd share with you a little bit more about both of the books that Renee just mentioned really quickly because they kind of together got me to where I am right now and what I'm interested in. So my first book was called Better Left Unsaid, Victorian Novels, Hayes Code Films and the Benefits of Censorship. And this was really my dissertation that I turned into a book. But as a graduate student, I knew that I was equally in love with Victorian literature and with uh, classical Hollywood film. I in particular am interested in kind of 1930s to early 1960s film. And I wanted to think of a project that would put these two um, fields into conversation with each other. And I realized that I'm very interested in movies that were made during the production code or the Hayes code when there was a lot of uh, censorship, but I don't find these to be movies that are, 
you know, overly uh, dry or dull or sexless or boring. I find them wonderful and really subversive and have a fabulous energy to them. And the same is how I feel about Victorian literature. So even though uh, Victorian literature was not censored in the same way as the production code, where it was a very explicit set, set of policies, I still think that a lot of um, the same principles were at play, kind of the censorship of morality, of middle-class morality of the, of the marketplace. So I wrote this book that kind of talked about how these two different kinds of censorship, how artists kind of find ways to slip things through the cracks and to be kind of subversive and have these undercurrents of kind of uh, rebellion and resistance in them. And so my second book, I wanted, I was first thinking I would also try to write a book that was half on film and half on Victorian literature. But as I started writing this book about runaway women, and um, it was going to be about Victorian literature and film, I realized there are just so many wonderful novels to talk about that go back further than the Victorian era. Um, people would hear my project and say, well, you have to talk about Clarissa if you're talking about runaway women. And I in fact go all the way back to 1684, which is when Afra Ben wrote a novel called Love Letters Between a Nobleman and His Sister, which is based on a real life story of a woman who runs away from home with her sister's husband. And it was made a huge scandal at the time. So anyway, this book, um, talks a lot about women's resistance to um, kind of being stuck in the home, being in these tight enclosed domestic spaces um, that are claustrophobic, that are sometimes abusive. And many times as I was writing this book, I, I would describe what these women were going through in these novels as gaslighting. And I've long been in love with the movie Gaslight that you guys are going to be watching for the next session. Um, I, I love this movie since I was a kid. I'm obsessed with Ingrid Bergman, so that's part of why. But I also, when the term gaslighting really started getting used all the time again, I think it's always been used. I remember hearing it growing up, certainly. But in the last decade or so, it really has kind of gone off the charts and people were always using this term. And I, of course, knowing the movie so well and the play that it's based on, I wanted to make sure everyone knew what the text really was that created this term, because it really does come from this specific text. And so then I had the idea to teach a class that was called Gaslighting, Sex, Gender and Mental Illness in Victorian and Neo-Victorian Literature and Film. And I taught that for the first time, I think in 2019. And I taught it again in 2023. And I love teaching this to my students, and I really feel that they they can they enter into Victorian literature. And um, in that class, I teach a lot of 1940s, what they call Gaslight Noir, which was a genre that kind of came about after the film Gaslight. And I love that genre, too, and I plan to write on that separately. But anyway, so I found this really um, productive. And then, uh, then the book project started coming about. Um, through, uh, I put together a, a panel at NAVSA, the Victorian Studies Conference, in 2022, I think it was, with uh, Tara McDonald. She and I put this uh, panel together, and one of our panelists on it was Diana Bellenby, a friend of mine. And after we gave this uh, panel at, at the conference, we, it just went so well, and people in the audience were just like, oh, this is something we want to think more about, and we did too. So we decided to uh, put together a CFP for a collection, and uh, we wound up gathering together 14 different essays by fabulous contributors all, and we're really excited about this. And we, I guess it was about a year ago now, last May, we uh, took our book proposal to SUNY Press, which has a fabulous um, series in the long 19th century uh, that's edited by Pamela Gilbert, and we got an advance contract at that time. So we're like a year in, so we're like in the, the very end, we're trying to get our full manuscript submitted to them by the end of May. So we're trying to finish up. We've got all of our, um, uh, our chapters in, but we're just at the revising stage and trying to get it all put together. So for today's talk, I thought what I would do is give you guys an overview of this collection, and I'm going to be using language from the book proposal that Diana and Tara and I uh, wrote together you know, a year ago, because we haven't written the introduction yet. We were going to do that at the very end once we had all the chapters done. But then I'm going to share with you excerpts from the section of the introduction that I'm currently working on that was the part that I was tasked with writing. And then I'm going to read to you parts of my own chapter because Diana, Tara, and I each contributed one chapter ourselves so that I finished my chapter so I can talk more about that. And I did want to say something about spoilers because I can't talk for 40 minutes about gaslighting without making it kind of clear that the plot of the movie you're about to watch for this is about gaslighting. And it is specifically, I'm giving it away, it's about a husband who gaslights his wife. I don't think that that is at all 
um, you're not going to realize that without within like the first few minutes of the film, as opposed to the play, which I'll talk about where in the play, I think you're really supposed to watch and have no idea that the husband is a bad guy until it, it develops. But both of the movie versions lay it on thick. And from the beginning, you know that that there's going to be this thing going on, but you don't know how it's going to happen and you don't know exactly how it's going to play out. So I'm going to try to talk about gaslighting without giving away plot points that I think would make the viewing experience, you know, worse for you. But I am going to talk in broad strokes about the idea that this movie is where we get the term gaslighting from. And I'm assuming that everybody probably has a pretty good sense of what gaslighting is. But these days, the way it tends to get uh, defined is that it's somebody who has more power than somebody else in one way or another is trying to manipulate that person and kind of deceive that person into doubting their own sense of reality, who they are, and making them feel like they're, quote, losing their mind. That's kind of how we think about gaslighting today. So this is going to be my overview of uh, Victorian gaslighting, genealogy of an injustice. Okay, so the term gaslighting has re-entered the popular lexicon with a vengeance in recent years, appearing in countless news stories, books, podcasts, and articles on sex, race, politics, medicine, and emotional abuse. Such accounts often briefly note that the term is drawn from a 20th century source text, George Cukor's 1944 film Gaslight, based on Patrick Hamilton's 1938 play of the same name, which tells the story of a sadistic husband who actively works to make his wife doubt her own sense of reality and fear that she is losing her mind. Not too often emphasized, however, is the fact that this story is ostentatiously set in late 19th century London. This setting is not only intrinsic to the plot insofar as it revolves around the gas-based lighting technology that reached its peak at the fin de siècle, but also because it serves as a hauntingly appropriate backdrop for the story's representations of marital violence, domestic confinement, psychological manipulation, and other mainstays of Victorian literature and culture. This essay collection, the first of its kind, traces the genealogy of gaslighting back to its Victorian roots. Its 14 chapters explore examples of gaslighting that appear in novels, novellas, poems, journals, autobiographies, newspaper articles, literary reviews, domestic manuals, letters to the editor, and medical reports that were written throughout the Victorian era and throughout the Victorian British Empire. Building on studies of contemporary gaslighting by philosophers, psychologists, sociologists, and political scientists, we seek to demonstrate the urgent value of historicizing a form of violence that is fundamentally tied to gender and race-based systems of oppression and the ways in which these systems were represented in 19th century literature. Philosopher Kate Abramson has observed that gaslighting often occurs in response to, quote, a woman's protestation against sexist or otherwise discriminatory conduct and relies on the target's internalization of sexist norms. While political scientists Angelique M. Davis and Rose Ernst define racial gaslighting as a process that perpetuates and normalizes a white supremacist reality through pathologizing those who resist it. Although the white male supremacist patterns of behavior that these scholars describe are certainly essential to understanding contemporary injustices, they were all also shaped in crucial ways by 19th century culture. The intersecting institutions of patriarchy, transatlantic slavery, and colonialism during this period made women and racialized others vulnerable to rhetorical attacks designed to undermine their capacity to articulate, authorize, and even believe their own lived experiences. These attacks, our collection asserts, are paradigmatic examples of what we would now call gaslighting. While the essays in our volume work hard to historicize gaslighting in its specific 19th century context, they also attend to the fact that we are engaging with these texts from our own varied 21st century perspectives. The collection also focuses on the global impacts of Victorianism by discussing texts set in the Caribbean, India, South Africa, America when it was still a British colony, and Eastern Europe. Ultimately, the 14 essays that we put into conversation with one another show both what we can learn about Victorian culture by reading it through the lens of gaslighting and what we can learn about contemporary forms of oppression and psychological abuse by reading them through the lens of Victorian culture. Okay, so now let's see if I can change it. No, that's not right. Hmm, I thought I had a, 
I thought I had a different slide here. Wait, 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 wait. is it next? There, okay, I think I messed up the order of my slides. So I wanted to show you the, um, the, the uh, table of contents and I was just gonna read out to you the names of the, the titles of the different chapters in our book because I feel like if you just hear the kind of sheer volume of different things that we're looking at, it will help you to picture it a little bit more, even though many of these texts you might not have heard of because we kind of purposely are not doing some of the, some of the more canonical stuff that you would have heard of. I just flipped by it, but we we're talking about it in our introduction. So real quickly, um, the 14, they're, they're, we're um, putting these into four different sections. The first of them is called Rape Culture and Rhetorical Control. And it has um, essays called A Matter of Practicality, Mary Prince and Abolitionist Gaslighting, Old Ladies, Male and Female, Gaslighting the Reader and Margaret Oliphant's The Perpetual Curate, uh, Gaslighting Vernon Lee, Hysteria, Rape Culture and the Origins of Psychoanalysis. And then our sec second section is called Case Studies and Institutional Gaslighting. And the first of those chapters is The Thraldom of Gas, Capitalist like Gaslighting and the Victorian Coal Gas Industry. Um, then there's one on structural scarcity, women's economic writing and access to the disciplines. And when evidence takes a supernatural character, religious gaslighting in Elizabeth Gaskell's Lois the Witch. Then our third section is called marital and monetary manipulations. And we have a chapter called gaslighting and the mixed race heiress and the woman of color and Vanity Fair. Um, a tale of two Catherines, Charles Dickens as gaslighter, which I'm going to put a pin and tell you a little bit about after I'm done reading this, because I think people here might be more interested in that chapter because of the Dickens connection. Um, and then one called Gaslighting and the Voiceless Woman in Victorian Poetry, and one called Whose Property Is It Anyway? Economic Gaslighting in the Victorian Novel. And then our last chapter uh, section is called The Gaslit Mind and Body, Illness, Injury, and Healing. And we've got chapters called Liars to the End, Gaslighting and Burial Practices in Wuthering Heights, Gaslighting the Maternal Body in Olive Shriners from Man to Man, Spiritual Energies, Gaslighting Gender and Communities of Healing in India. And then my chapter is the last one, Strange Intonations, the Foreign Accents of Disabling Mind Control in Trilby Dracula and the two film versions of Gaslight. So really quick, uh, Catherine Kim, who wrote the chapter on, on gaslighting, she talked about possibly being here. I can't tell if she is or not because I can only see a few names on here. But uh, the, the impetus for this chapter um, was uh, a few years back. You might remember that John Bowen, who attends Dickens University very often, he was kind of in the news for a while because he found this letter um, in the archives that seemed to reinforce what people kind of already knew or suspected, which was that Dickens had, it really seems to suggest Dickens had tried to have his wife, Catherine, um, consigned to an insane asylum and that the doctor kind of said, no, he, he wouldn't do it. Um, and at the time that that happened, it was like in the regular press, it was Charles Dickens is a gaslighter. And so um, people were kind of excited to make that connection. This chapter talks both about um, uh, his relationship with Catherine Dickens, his wife, but also Catherine Crow, who's a lesser known um, woman author from the time period and his relationship with her and she suffered from mental illness and kind of how he treated her. So we talk about him there, but we do also talk about him as you'll see a little bit in our introduction as somebody who wrote about uh, narrative of gaslighting as well. So, all right, so that's our, our breakdown. Um, this month, Tara, Diane, and I are actually in the process of writing the introduction for the collection, which will probably use some of the language from the book proposal I just read to you, but will also include a few other sections that I wanted to sketch out for you. So one section will provide an overview of 19th and early 20th century feminist thinkers who are really talking and writing about what we would now call gaslighting before the term was coined in Patrick Hamilton's play, and one section will provide an overview of some of the most famous Victorian literary texts whose plots are pretty overtly proto gaslighty in nature. So the four te literary texts that we're going to talk about are, now I have to go backwards to my slide, take away, whoop, I'm not gonna surprise, I'm backwards surprising. Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre is the first that we're talking about, which is definitely a concern with issues of marital abuse and mental illness and confinement and romantic manipulation and deception, all of which are so central to the gaslighting plot. And then we'll be talking about uh, Wilkie Collins' The Woman in White, which is probably the most famous Victorian wrongful consignment in an insane asylum plot. And we'll be talking about Charlotte Perkins Gilman's short story, The Yellow Wallpaper, which even though it's American, not British, and we're trying mainly to stick to British texts, is just such a well-known narrative of marital and medical gaslighting, a key component of which again is confinement in the home, causing a woman to lose her grasp on reality and lose her mind. 
And then the fourth text, which most, most of you will appreciate, is um, Dickens's Little Dorrit, in particular the subplot about Mrs. Flintwinch's dreams, where, wherein Flintwinch tries to convince Afri through both psychological and physical abuse that she's only imagining all the ominous and nefarious things that, of course, really are going on around her in Mrs. Clennam's haunted house as she thinks of it. So we think of that subplot as being very, very gaslighty. Um, okay, so let's see. Now I'm out of order with my slides. Where was I? Um, those are the two sections of the introduction that my co-editors, Diana and Tara, are going to be taking the lead on writing. But the section that I'm in charge of, which I just finished writing up this past week, is a section that lays out the more complicated than you might expect history of the various stage and screen versions of Gaslight that jointly contribute to our sense of what gaslighting is today. So I'm going to read you about half of that section as a way of setting up the movie that you're going to be watching prior to our next session. But the second half of that uh, really talks about the plot differences between the different versions. So I'm not going to share that half of it with you today in the name of avoiding plot spoilers. But I could uh, talk about it more next time if you are interested. So um, let's see. The, the, the section is called Not One But Many Gaslights. Simply put, to understand gaslighting, one must understand gaslight. But even though many articles and books on the subject of gaslighting do implicitly acknowledge this to be true by making an at least cursory nod to the term's textual origin, the text to which they almost always allude is the Hollywood film version of Gaslight from 1944, when in fact that film was the fourth successful iteration of the Gaslight narrative to be produced in the UK and the US over a six year period. It is especially egregious when these articles and books make no mention of the original 1938 play, Gaslight, Two Words, by Patrick Hamilton, since it is Hamilton who must be credited with conceiving of the story that captures the form of psychological abuse that we now call gaslighting so disturbingly, gut-wrenchingly well. Patrick Hamilton um, is perhaps best known today for his two very successful stage plays that were made into Hollywood movies, so Gaslight and also Rope. Um, though he, along with many critics of his day, considered his novels, The Midnight Bell, Hangover Square, The Slaves of Solitude, etc., to be his greater artistic achievements. Critical acclaim on multiple fronts notwithstanding, Hamilton never achieved the same kind of name recognition that many of his equally lauded contemporaries did. In the words of one of his biographers, he continues to be, quote, an eerie non-presence in modern British literary history. Gaslight is, it should be noted, somewhat of an outlier in Hamilton's oeuvre insofar as its, its primary sympathies lie with a victimized woman. In his novels, it is typically an innocent young man who is being driven to a breakdown or even murder by a calculating, attractive young woman who doesn't return his infatuation, as Miranda Miller has summarized. The semi-autobiographical nature of these novels is widely acknowledged, with Nigel Jones even going so far as to say, quote, it is fortunate that Patrick Hamilton had the talent to sublimate his darker desires and transmute them into some of the 20th century's most highly regarded dramas and fiction. If he had not, he himself could have become one of the criminals, con artists, and murderers who people his works, end quote. But Nigel Jones also points out another clear biographical referent for the male, violent male characters of Hamilton's fictional cosmos, especially Gaslight. Quote, a Jack Manningham's abuse of Bella, that's the name of the, the husband and the wife in the play version, uh, his abuse of Bella has become emblematic for feminists of patriarchy within the family. Patrick Hamilton knew whereof he wrote since he sprang from just such a family. His father, Bernard Hamilton, a pretentious novelist known in the family as the old devil, was a bullying alcoholic who held his wife Nellie and their children in thrall with pseudo military discipline. Importantly though, in Gaslight, Hamilton doesn't choose to write about patriarchal domestic abuse from a young son's, i.e. his own point of view. He chooses to write about it from the vantage point of the bullied, sadistically disciplined wife. And it was this vantage point, this woman's story, that resonated so strongly with audiences on both sides of the Atlantic in the four major productions of Gaslight that were staged and filmed over the course of World War II. So I made a little chart um, that can help you visualize the timeline and some of the differences between these four major productions, but I'll also walk you through them verbally. 
So the first production of Gaslight premiered at the Richmond Theater in London on December 5th, 1938, then relocated to the Apollo Theater, and then the Savoy on May 22nd, 1939, where its initial run came to an end after a total of 141 performances. Within a year, the first film adaptation of the play had been commissioned, written, and produced, directed by Thorold Dickinson, penned by A.R. Rawlinson and Bridget Boland, and starring Anton Walbrook and Diane Wynyard, Gaslight was released by British National Films on June 25, 1940. Next came the American adaptations. First, a short-lived Los Angeles stage production in the spring of 1941 that was seen by an intrigued Vincent Price, who immediately went about securing the rights so that he could star in a Broadway production himself, renamed Angel Street, by the end of the same year. In spite of this production's initial unlucky timing with Pearl Harbor Day decimating the public's desire for theatrical entertainment just two days after its premiere on December 5th, Angel Street soon rebounded and wound up becoming one of the longest running non-musical Broadway plays of all time, logging in a total of 1,295 performances before its closing night on December 30th, 1944. Impressed by the critical and popular successes of these three consecutive versions of Hamilton's tale, Hollywood soon came calling with its largest and most prestigious studio, MGM, purchasing the remake rights from British National in 1942. MGM's version, directed by George Cukor, adapted by John Van Druten, Walter Reich, and John Balderston, and starring Ingrid Bergman, Charles Boyer, and a scene-stealing Angela Lansbury in her very first screen role, premiered on May 4th, 1944, and became the most decorated version of them all. Nominated for Academy Awards for Best Picture, Best Actor, Best Supporting Actress, Best Screenplay, Best Art Direction, Best Cinematography, and Best Actress, it won for the latter two and continues to be considered one of the greatest psychological thrillers in American film history. So though it is certainly not unusual for a Hollywood adaptation or remake to outperform or overshadow its precursors, MGM appears in this case to have gone to greater lengths than usual to make sure that such outperforming would happen. They included in their rights acquisition contract with British National, a clause that authorized the destruction of all existing prints of the earlier film. In relating the story of this incident, one recent critic even described it as MGM's attempt to quote, gaslight audiences by pretending that the British movie never existed. At least one copy of the British print did survive, however, and today the internet abounds with film websites that weigh in on whether the 1940 or 1944 Gaslight is the better film of the two. In making their assessments, such sites frequently lay out the main differences between the British National and MGM versions, with some basing their preference for the former on the fact that it hues more closely to Patrick, Patrick Hamilton's original script. While this is true to an extent, the specific content of Hamilton's original script is actually harder to pinpoint than most people realize. For one thing, overviews of the theatrical and cinematic history of Gaslight tend to suggest that Broadway's Angel Street was more or less identical to London's Gaslight, when in fact the dialogue and stage directions seen in the first editions of the two productions that we have Constable and Company's 1939 edition of Gaslight and Samuel French's 1942 edition of Angel Street, those editions differ in a large number of small but sometimes really significant ways. Even more destabilizing to our sense of what constitutes the original Gaslight though, is a 53 page document that I found in the MGM production files for its film version of Gaslight that are housed at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, Margaret, Hart, Margaret Herrick Library. So this document is dated 4-22-42 and it bears the title Gaslight Angel Street Movie Version. I just give you a sliver of it here because if it goes past that you could read the plot spoilers that I'm trying to avoid sharing with you today. Um, so, but it announces its purpose in its opening sentence. Quote, in preparing a brief analysis of the three versions of the play, it becomes clear at once that the most obvious point of difference is the, thir the third act, the act in which the denouement occurs. This was then a comparative analysis commissioned by MGM executives to get a handle on the plot variations of previous Gaslight productions before embarking on a production of their own. What's so very striking about this document is that the obviously different third act of the English play that the document's unnamed author describes is not the same as the third act of the 1939 Constable and Company first edition 
or the third act of the purportedly original edition held in the British Library's Lord Chamberlain's Plays collection, or the third act of any other archival copy we have been able to locate thus far. The alternative third act described in this MGM document is, in other words, something of an eerie non-presence in Gaslight's dramaturgical history. So this is where, in my part of the introduction, I start discussing some of the plot differences between the different versions, which I won't get into this time. I will just give you the teaser that, according to this MGM document, in the original stage play, quote, the climax belongs to Bella, meaning the gaslit heroine. She's called Paula in the version you'll be watching. Whereas in all the later versions, quote, the climax belongs to Ruff, meaning the detective. He's called Brian Cameron in the Hollywood movie. So keep that in mind, in the back of your mind while you're watching the film. And then at the beginning of our next session, I can talk more about what that means and about some of the other material that I talk about uh, that I think it's too close to uh, plot spoiling for comfort. So now I would like to uh, turn to sharing a bit of my chapter that I wrote for this collection, just so you can hear one example of how we're putting gaslight and gaslighting into conversation with Victorian literature and culture. So my chapter is again called Strange Intonations, the Foreign Accents of Disabling Mind Control in Trilby, Dracula, and the two film versions of Gaslight. And I know that Renee assigned Dracula for her friend's faculty fellowship sessions last year. So maybe some of you will be very familiar with that in that context. You probably, a lot of you probably already know Dracula anyway, and that will be a little helpful. But um, first though, I'm just gonna read you the opening paragraph that sets up what I'm trying to do in my chapter. So. One of the deepest, darkest fears that Patrick Hamilton taps into with his harrowing tale of psychological abuse is the fear that our mental health and along with it, our physical health is inherently violatable. That another person can, in other words, cause us to become mentally and or physically ill simply by proclaiming us to be so. This fear loomed especially large for the Victorians thanks to certain medical theories about nervous suggestibility and neuromimesis that were gaining more and more traction throughout the period. For while some doctors touted the ability to their ability to harness the power of suggestion for salutary purposes by engaging in the emerging medical practice of hypnotherapy, others warned of the grave harm such power could do to vulnerable and impressionable patients. In the 1890s, the decade during which Hamilton's gaslighting plot is set, two best-selling British novels depicted the dangerous, deleterious side of mind control by pointedly and xenophobically casting a foreign character in the role of the nefarious mesmerist. We have George du Maurier's Trilby from 1894 and Graham Stoker's Dracula from 1897. In my chapter, I read du Maurier's Svengali and Stoker's titular vampire as key genealogical precursors to the conspicuously un-English husband figures featured in the two film versions of Gaslight, played by Austrian actor uh, Anton Walbrook in British National's 1940 production and French actor Charles Boyer in MGM's 1944 one. Like Trilby and Dracula before them, both cinematic adaptations of Hamilton's play emphasize the interconnections between fear, foreignness, forcefulness, and psychosomatic susceptibility. So to understand how those interconnections came to be so deeply entrenched in the British cultural imagination by the last decade of the 19th century, we need to bear in mind where the majority of developments in the field of medicalized mind control had been taking place in the century leading up to it, namely not in England. And then I have this whole section where I sketch out the histories of mesmerism and its close cousin hypnotism over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries, the most prominent and influential practitioners of which were for the most part, German, French, and Austrian, not British, because the Brits were much more skeptical of its medical efficacy and worried about unethical mesmer mesmerists and hypnotists taking advantage of their female patients in particular while they were under the influence. And then I also describe how by the end of the 19th century, these fears were especially directed at Jewish doctors who practiced hypnotherapy. For example, Hippolyta Bernheim in France, Albert Moll in Germany, Joseph Brewer, and before he turned from hypnosis, hypnosis to psychoanalysis as his primary medical approach, Brewer's protege, Sigmund Freud in Austria. By the late 19th century, in other words, fears about the potentially nefarious power of the unscrupulous hypnotist were being grafted 
onto longstanding but also historically specific fears about the quote, surreptitiously invasive, successfully insinuating Jew as Daniel Pick has described the anti-Semitic trope. In the quote, literature, journalism and political thought on both sides of the channel of the 1890s, Pick points out, Jews were often depicted as contaminating the mind and bodies of Gentiles, as well as controlling everything from the stock market to public taste and art. So after setting up all of that historical background, my chapter proceeds to read Trilby, Dracula, and the two film versions of Gaslight through the lens of this particular brand of xenophobia. It's most obvious in Trilby, which many of you may not have read, but you may be more familiar with the basic plot of it than you realize. The term Svengali, which these days is used to mean a person who exercises a controlling or mesmeric influence on another, frequently for some sinister purpose, per the OED, that, that name comes from Trilby, which was one of the biggest bestsellers of the late Victorian era. In that novel, Svengali is a Jewish musician with Austrian and Polish roots who's living in Paris and winds up hypnotizing a young woman named Trilby, who's a bohemian young woman of Irish, Scottish, and English descent. Svengali at first hypnotizes Trilby to help her with the pain in the eyes that she's suffering from, but eventually he does it for his own sinister purposes, which are partially to transform her into the greatest opera singer of all time. Somehow she's able to sing magnificently when she's under his hypnotic spell, but is completely tone deaf when she's not. But also it is strongly implied so that he can take advantage of her sexually while she is thus spellbound. This novel is, to be clear, ragingly anti-Semitic in its portrayal of the invasive hypnotist. Sangali is described as tawdry and dirty, grossly impertinent, about as bad as they make him. And a lot of the vitriol is specifically leveled at his awful foreign accent. We're told, for example, that, quote, he speaks that he speaks fluent French, but that it sounds much more ghastly because it's pronounced with a Hebrew German accent and uttered in his hoarse, rasping, nasal, throaty rook's caw, his big yellow teeth bearing themselves in a mongrel canine snarl, his heavy upper eyelids drooping over his insolent black eyes. So could be more insulting and animalizing and all these things to its Jewish character. Um, so in this part of my chapter, I lay out the ways in which the novel Trilby directly plays into Victorian fears about the threat, the sexual threat of hypnotic practices that I just mentioned, including importantly, the xenophobic, and in this case, specifically anti-Semitic dynamic of many such fears. Then in my next section, I draw parallels between Trilby and Dracula, which as probably a lot of you are familiar with, is also about a pointedly non-Christian Eastern European foreigner who uses his powers of hypnotism, as Jonathan Harker specifically refers to them, to assault and control the minds of young innocent English women like Lucy and Mina. Uh, Dracula, Dracula doesn't have the exaggeratedly foreign accent than Svengali does. Jonathan Harker specifically notes that he speaks, quote, excellent English, but with a strange intonation, which is where I got my title for this chapter from. But that doesn't mean that he's portrayed any less xenophobically. As Dirk de la, de la Bastita has pointed out, Dracula's honing of his linguistic skills as a speaker of English serves as, quote, a strategy of camouflage and infiltration. Linguistic assimilation enables him to get behind the front line and blend in. This makes him doubly dangerous. There is, though, one character in Dracula who butchers the English language just as much as Fengali does in Trilby, the Dutch Dr. Van Helsing, who also winds up practicing hypnotism on Mina. But crucially, he does so at Mina's behest, which both grants her a level of autonomy in her, in her hypnotizing plot far greater than what Trilby had experienced in hers, and also serves to mark Van Helsing as the good hypnotist, just as he's depicted as the good foreigner by dint of being Christian and Western European in sharp contrast to non-Christian Eastern European monstrous Dracula. So because Trilby and Dracula were two of the most widely read and culturally influential novels of the late 19th century, they played a not insignificant role in shaping the way late Victorians thought about mesmerism, monstrousness, and certain kinds of foreignness. In my chapter's last section, I trace some of the connections between Trilby and Dracula and Gaslight. For even though what the husband does to the wife in Gaslight is not technically mesmerism or hypnotism, and even though the issue of foreignness does not factor into Patrick Hamilton's original gaslighting plot in any way, 
What the husband does to the wife is a form of manipulative, debilitating mind control, just as mesmerism and hypnotism are portrayed to be in Trilby and Dracula. And both of the 1940s film adaptations do insert the issue of foreignness into the gaslighting proceedings by way of their casting choices. So to be clear, in the original stage version, the gaslighting husband is an Englishman, which means that the kind of abuse being depicted is painted as a pointedly internal domestic, by which I mean both contained within the home and contained within the nation, affair. But the dynamics of the gaslighting plot really shift, I argue, when Austrian half-Jewish actor Anton Walbrook plays the husband in the British national film, and when French actor Charles Boyer plays the part in the MGM one. And I did just want to interject here that if any of you want to watch both the British and the American film versions before our next Zoom session, you're more than welcome to do so. The British version is streamable on YouTube for free right now. You can just search for Gaslight 1940 and it should come right up. But you don't have to read, we watch both of them. You can just do the, the Hollywood one uh, and we will definitely concentrate our discussion on that film. But they both are fascinating in their own right. So feel free to do a double header. Um, at any rate, what's interesting about the British film is that it explicitly discusses the fact that Paul Mallon, as his name is changed to in that film, is a foreigner and kind of repeatedly suggests that that's really bad and probably contributing heavily to his psychopathic monstrousness. And in that film, Anton Walbrook is the only non-English actor playing one of the main parts, so his accent really, really stands out. In the MGM version, on the other hand, as you'll see, it's a little more complicated. Swedish Ingrid Bergman plays the wife, American Joseph Cotton plays the detective, and French Charles Boyer plays the husband. But the nationalities of Bergman, Cotton, and Boyer do not graft neatly onto our sense of the Englishness or non-Englishness of their respective characters within the film, as is the case in the British film version. For example, although Joseph Cotton doesn't even attempt to make his accent sound British instead of American, the film makes no reference to his Americanness. He is an employee of Scotland Yard who has a niece and nephew with strong English accents, and it's implied that he has lived in London himself since he was a young boy. And even though Paula's last name, Alquist, does suggest her Swedishness, we also know that the London townhouse in Thornton Square, where the majority of the film's action takes place, is where she was brought up until the death of her aunt caused her to relocate to Italy, in one early draft of the screenplay, in fact, a description line mentions that even though the heroine is a cosmopolitan woman whose nationality is unclear, quote, when she speaks, she speaks pure English. Um, so Boyer's character, on the other hand, is certainly meant to feel impurely foreign and not totally in a French way. Paul meets him in Italy, eventually learns that he used to live in Prague, and also the same screenplay draft that mentions the pureness of Paula's English speaking voice actually specifies that the character is Polish. Um, quote, it says, an accompanist, Boyer, Boyer Polish and 40-ish, is accompanying Paula on the piano, it reads. What this means is that even after Boyer, the French lover, as he was known throughout his Hollywood career, had been cast in the role of the gaslighting husband, the filmmaking powers that be wanted his character to retain some of the more Eastern European mystique with which Anton Walbrook had imbued it in the British film adaptation. I also wanted to point out that after seeing an early cut of the film, David O. Selznick, who had loaned out Ingrid Bergman and Joseph Cotton to MGM for the production and was therefore invested in its success, he made clear which particular Eastern European figure he thought Boyer's character should be evoking in audiences' minds. As he wrote in a memo to Cukor, quote, the picture is in desperate need of at least two more scenes in which we see the husband as a lover, in which we see both his tenderness and also the Svengali-like sex hold that he has over her. Boyer is at his best in such scenes. The rave reviews that Boyer wound up receiving for his performance in the final cut of the film proved the shrewdness of Stahl's next recommendation. Reviews in both the New York Times and Daily Variety specifically praised Boyer for his hypnotic performance, while more recent critics have specifically noted its Svengalian flair. And I was going to share, this is an Italian movie poster of Gaslight. This scene doesn't actually happen in the movie, but it really makes it look like he's hypnotizing her with this uh, match, and this is not quite how how light will work in the, in, in the movie, but you'll see that lighting matters a whole lot in this movie, but I just want to leave with this image. 
Um, so after I get to that point in my chapter, I really launch into a close reading of the two Gaslight films that puts them into conversation with mesmerism, hypnotism, Trilby, and Dracula, but in ways that mention things I don't want to spoil for you before you've watched the movies. But ultimately, I will just wrap up by saying that what I'm highlighting in this chapter is the fact that both 1940s film adaptations of Gaslight quietly but troublingly played off of ingrained Victorian stereotypes about the physical and mental harm that mesmerists of a certain foreign persuasion could and would do to impressionable young English women. It is important, I think, for us to recognize that this too is part of the ideological work that the cinematic gaslighting narrative performs along with its hauntingly powerful indictment of psychosomatic brutality. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing, and there we go. That is my main part of my talk. <laughs> so nice to see Pan that I can't hear, but I'm very grateful. So now should we, we should open it up to questions, and I should just kind of pose it. Yeah, I mean, please ask me anything you want about anything I just talked about. I would also love, even before... You, you watch the movie, I'm sure some of you have seen this movie before, but if you wanna start thinking about how you see gaslighting in other uh, Victorian texts, I'm, I'm endlessly interested in that topic as well. So whenever anyone wants to ask. Yes, feel free to, feel free to raise hands. And, and um, as I mentioned before, uh, use the raise hand function um, in order to do that so we can keep track of you. Nora, do you wanna call on people? Oh, I guess so. So Michael. Um. Yeah. Um, does Rasputin figure into this in any way? Well, not in the way that I'm, uh, not in my chapter, but I certainly could see, you know, the way that that, I mean, there are so many, if we go outside of British culture, you can go into, I mean, it's just, it's just everywhere, but I do think that's a very good, you know, reference point and for sure, but I don't, I don't bring it into my chapter just because I'm trying to do many things, but I do think that that is a, a, a powerful thing to think about in that history too. Yeah and how it relates to all this. Yeah, but I don't have much more to say because I haven't put it in, but thank you for that. Oh, and I want to call you Emed, but I should call you Elizabeth. <laughs> Everyone calls you Emed. Emed is fine in this context. Um, I Thank you so much, Nora, for that wonderful talk. It's so exciting um, to, to hear all this coming together. I was really struck by what you said about how the... Um, the, the various texts changed over the course of, you know, the until we come to the movie, and also the introduction of foreignness, which seems to me really well calculated to remove the attention from the sort of infrastructural element. Like, the problem yeah. is that he can do what he's doing in a lot of ways because of the gaslight technology, right, which is sort of emphasized in the first one, it's gaslight, right? right and if right. I recall correctly, it's because of the fluctuations in the flow of gas. So yeah. you know how I obsessed I am with sort of city infrastructure and the way yeah. that innovations in infrastructure offer new plot possibilities. And I'm just wondering if there are other ways that we can think of in which infrastructural developments, like removing the focus from it's the infrastructure that enables this to it's the foreignness that's the danger and displacing mm -hmm. that danger outwards. I'm just sort of wondering like what other ways can we think of in which the very shape of, of how people are living as, as cities grow more dense, as people grow more private, that offer even more opportunities for gaslighting with something other than gaslights, right? Like what are the other technologies of gaslighting that become um, maybe even more prevalent? It, you know, I know that you guys address this in your, in your collection today. Like how are we seeing technologies of gaslighting now? Um, mm -hmm. oh, rather I, than yeah. No, I have so many things I want to respond to that. I'm trying to figure out where to start. I mean, I feel like I'm cheating because I want to tell you about more that happens in our collection that aren't things that I actually wrote. Like, for example, we have a chapter um, written by Grace Franklin um, who, that's about the gas coal industry. And so when it was being created in the 19th century, there's just such fabulous corollary that they really were trying to convince mostly working class people who are either working in the, you know, in the, um, to, to near all the dangerous new technologies, or they were living in houses that were right near the, the what you're talking about, the city infrastructure where the gas pipelines were going and everything. And so even for, I mean, this is still going on. We can do, I just said gas pipeline, you're, you're thinking 
thinking about contemporary events. But even in the 19th century, they were saying, we're freaked out by this. We think it's going to blow up, basically. We were having all this gas. There's fires could happen very easily. And the gas coal industry had all these pamphlets were saying they're just being so paranoid and it's all in their head. And look at these, uh, you know, nervous Nellies kind of thing and really um, undermining them in ways that would be called gaslighting. So there's a real clear connection to that. I would also say that there's an article from a while ago by Kay Young that's about, it compares Gaslight, the film, the, the 1944 film, to Pamela, the Richardson novel, and talk, because they were both, uh, Richardson's novel is in a Georgian terrace which you really will see the shape of this house when you watch this movie. It plays a big role. The fact that it's the kind of house, a townhouse in London on one of the squares where it's the, the structure is the, the staircase where everything goes up like that. And so she does an architectural kind of analysis comparing these two things because the movie version really, it matters the structure because you'll see the, the attic is gonna play a role in all that. But so just the verticality of kind of urban living that's something that it seems to, I, I don't see you anymore, Ahmed. you went away. So I'm looking at just, but in general, I want to respond to what you're saying and saying that that's a, a version of how um, the city structures can change the way you, you can create these forms of claustrophobic um, abuse. Because I think claustrophobia, I'm, I'm very claustrophobic myself. And so I really identify with the sense of the movie is so much part of how he makes her think she's going crazy. I won't name, but it has to do with material objects. But part of it is just convincing her to stay in this particularly claustrophobically uh, structured house and feeling like everybody's right on top of each other. I think that really has a lot to do with the uh, kind of psychological dynamics of it. Um, and in terms, oh, I was going to say with Grace Franklin's chapter, what she's talking about this back in the day with the uh, the Victorians, but she also points out that do you remember just like what was it like six months ago when the when it became all in the news that gas stoves are really terrible for us and <laughs> we can't actually have them in our houses and the oh my gosh the industry was like shut that down make everyone say how great they love their cooking because as the gas light and, and we know that this is actually bad for our health bad for the environment but they really shut it down and that conversation kind of went away and they really were pretty successful in doing the same maneuvers that um that chapter focuses on capitalist gaslighting and how you can um, uh, structure the way you talk about what you sell in these ways. So anyway, yeah, that's a lot that I wanted to say all in response to your wonderful question. So um, thank I think- Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I don't see you, but you're welcome. And Patricia, I, that's who I see next in my hands. I hope that's right. I don't know if that's the right order, but- Oh, I can't hear you, you're muted. Oh, you're muted. Can you say that again? Can you hear me? I am smack in the middle of central London. Uh-huh. Nice. And, and I have lived here for the vast majority of my life. Mm -hmm. Although have also lived in central Europe. Prague mm -hmm. is not Eastern Europe. It is no central church, church Europe. Europe. You're right. But they do they, they do say I, so so I can't say but but you're right. One must be a little more accurate. You're right. You're very Apart right. Apart from that. Um <laughs> Gaslighting for most of us in London is simply people going around in the 19th, late 19th and early 20th century lighting the lamps. Mm -hmm. We did not consider it in the same way that the phrase is used right. in, right. in either of the films or indeed in the books. And having said that, there were certainly instances in 19th century Victorian literature where the, how will I put it, things went on under the gas lights, mm -hmm. but it wasn't used as a phrase, or at right. least I haven't found it in most of the 19th century literature that I have read. Yeah. So I am finding this fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Because I have seen neither of the films. Mm -hmm. I suppose I might watch them. <laughs> but I am really rather familiar with 19th century Victorian literature. Yeah. I'll leave it there. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. This term does not get used in the way that we're thinking about it as this form of psychological abuse ever in Victorian literature. It was actually 
it came about from this particular text and until so I mean certainly gaslights are all over the place in Victorian literature but they're not thinking of it this way I will say this it's I'll, I can't say much about this yet but almost always when you read something that's describing the gaslight plot it describes it wrong in terms of what it says the relationship between the light in this in this movie and the way that he's psychologically manipulating her. So I will correct that for you. You'll probably maybe notice it yourselves. But um, so, but you're absolutely right that I'm not at all suggesting that they used to use this back in the day. But I am thinking that it is now that it's used. Now that it's kind of really picked up. Let's face it. In the last you know decade, in in, in the United States, it had a lot to do with post-Trumpian times, but I've, I've read um, articles that are from in the UK that um, relate it to discourse around Brexit and so forth. So certainly there are ways, and again, there are, you can find people using this term in the 1970s. Adrian Rich uses it to talk about feminist empowerment in the 1970s. So it's not like this is new, but it is, I do think, has taken off in a way that we have never seen before. And um, that's what we're so interested in connecting the dots between now, the 1930s and 40s, when this text was created and the Victorian era where um, we think a lot of connects. Thank you. Yeah. Did you want to say more? Look like you're, Patricia, look like you're saying more? No, you're good. Okay. All right. Then I see Deborah. Hi there. Thank you for such a fascinating talk. I, I found it really, really interesting. Um, what I'm really curious about, and I just want to, I probably can add my own experience and my own research here, is that in, ter in terms of UK law, um, gaslighting has only recently been um, defined by legislation to, to have the meaning that you sort of delineated when you began your talk. Um, so I find that really interesting. But I was just wondering in terms of what you've done within the book, whether you actually go back and look at incidences of what we now call gaslighting within the Victorian novel. And if you compare that to what was going on in when we had advances in the law that actually were starting to give rights to women. So if you think about the Dickens example, um, when he was trying to get his wife put away in, in you know, a madhouse. Um, th there was the new divorce law coming in, which was giving greater rights to married women. So I was just wondering if there's a correlation between these incidences portrayed within the Victorian novel and what was going on within the law. Yes, I want to talk about this so much more, and I'm trying to think what are the things I can say based on what I don't want to give away from the film or not, because we have, for example, a chapter of our book that's very much about women's property rights, and because you'll see... And I can talk about it's different in all the different gaslight texts, how they treat the property, who, where, wh whether the woman has the money or not, how she, how she gets, how she inherits, how it's very much about that. The plot is very much about jewels and property and housing and so forth. So the laws as they're changing. And what's interesting about the timeline of this play is that we found, I think the earliest version we found, it specifies that it takes place in 1893, but then that gets wiped out and it just says in the end of the Victorian era sometime in the British movie, it specifies, let's see if I get this right, it specifies that it starts in 18... 65 and then uh, 20 years later is the present day so we're in 1885 and then the American movie it starts in 1875 but it's only 10 years later so we're still in 1885 but all of this matters based on what the how the laws shifted right and so some of the things about how the property works would have been different if it had been said in the 1860s versus the 1880s versus the 1890s so we are very cognizant of that and the other thing is that the the mat the lunacy laws um were played a big role in how we're thinking about this and it becomes a key Key point in the movie. I don't think this is giving anything away that they keep mentioning you need to have two doctors to agree to have somebody put in an insane asylum. And so it's really, um, they kind of keep bringing it down to the, the logistics of the law in terms of how he's going to manipulate the plot, to the, the, the system to be able to get his woman, uh, his wife in, incarcerated, really. So that's really crucial to it. But it is interesting that, of course, the laws doesn't, doesn't name gaslighting, doesn't even get at the idea of what we would call gaslighting now. Um, during this time period. So it's really fascinating to see how, how the law is catching up with the reality. But I do think this is relatively unique to have a fictional text, a play slash movie that created a term that now is making its way into the law. I mean, there have been variations on that, but this is just so very explicit that it's just like you can't, I just keep telling people you can't really understand Gaslight until you familiarize yourself with one of these fictional texts because they walk you through it so explicitly what it is. And I think most people, when I teach this, my students are go, oh, I thought I knew what gaslighting is. But once they watch the movie, they're like, 
oh, now I totally get what it is. And that all, it kind of, it, it just, the plot really works to make it come across what it is that we're, that we all kind of in our guts knew is true, you know? So, yeah. Don't know if that answered your question, but certainly the, the difference between the laws then and there are kind of crucial to how we're going to set this up in our introduction. We just haven't written it yet. So, so thank you. For... Um, I look forward to reading it and to see what you make of um, the, the English law. Yeah, no, that's great to, to focus on. No, we'll mm -hmm. remember Nora, someone in the chat asked um, if you know when the book might be coming out, if you have a, a pub date or have any general sense of it. No, we are going to, as I said, we're going to submit it for um, peer review at the end of May. So hopefully it will, I mean, I will say that we, when we submitted our book proposal, they got back to us like in two weeks saying that they wanted an advance contract, but it, it depends how long it takes the reviewers. And then from there, it'll probably be another year. So this is probably 2025. Um, before it's actually out, but we're kind of try to, um, you know, do some stuff to keep it. We're going to do, I think, a visa list, which is an, a, another virtual panel. So we're going to try to keep doing stuff to keep it um, being promoted or kind of like talking about it before it actually emerges too. So hopefully that will keep happening. Can I ask a question? You can. Um, so I, I love the way that you're putting Trilby and Dracula and the Gaslight movies together. And um it made me think, and so I haven't, I will admit I haven't, I haven't watched Gaslight yet. So I don't, I don't know what the deal is. But um, you know, so you know, Dracula is a novel that deals explicitly in the world of the supernatural. Like, you know, Dracula's powers are, you know, are not simply that he, you know, he can hypnotize, but you know, his his hypnotic powers come from his um, you know, his vampiric nature and Trilby, it's not exactly supernatural, but, but there is something, you know, there is something not natural about Svengali. Like there, it, you know, there, there are suggestions in that text that, um, that, you know, that something, something beyond simply, you know, the science of mind control is at work. And so I'm just wondering, like, how to think about the relationship between, between the, the kind of supernatural, overtones, undertones, plots of those two novels and the relationship between hypnotism and mesmerism and these kinds of, you know, gothic imaginaries that were happening at the end of the 19th century and and the world of Gaslight, which, you know, which is certainly about mind control and about convincing somebody that that a thing that that they think is, you know, is real isn't real. And, you know, so so there it's it's also about this this kind of movement between the real and the unreal, but it you know, but but the the kind of supernatural gothic doesn't operate in the same way. So um so could you just maybe like riff on that a little bit more? And definitely riff on that. I love riff. I, this is something I definitely bring up in my class gaslighting when I'm teaching to my students because it's a little bit simplistic, but some people may have heard that people like to talk about the female gothic versus the male gothic with the, starting in the late 18th century and the male gothic being like um, Monk Lewis and the, the, the monk and, it, and it's actually devils and angels and, and the supernatural. And then there's a lot, the Anne Radcliffe the school of the Gothic, where I guess I'm now plot spoiling an entire genre, but the idea is that you're all, there are always these women who think that there are supernatural things afoot and there are, I think there are ghosts and things are haunted or there's a, a buried nun crying. It always turns out that, nope, it's not ghosts or supernatural. It's just the patriarchy. It's just evil men doing plotting against you. I always just describe it to my students as like Scooby-Doo where they pull off the mask and they're like, oh, it's just one of you, one for you rascally kids. And that sort of, I think, is the difference between Trilby and, and, and certainly Dracula. Dr you're right, Trilby is in that kind of gray zone that you're like, well, officially you can, hypnosis is a real thing, but it makes it very exaggerated. You get to be the greatest opera singer of all time just because you're hypnotized. But certainly Dracula is, you know, the male Gothic, whereas this is in the realm of the female Gothic. So you are gonna have, and again, I guess I kind of su said, surprise, it's not ghosts, but she's very afraid that the house is haunted. Like this is what, you know, as is true in so much female Gothic literature, and then the answer is that it's something that is real and real in, in quotation marks. But I personally am very drawn to um, realism that is dabbling with the idea of the uh, is the supernatural in our world or isn't it? And you know, and, then, and for people who do know, like the 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 uh, Miss Little Dorrit, uh, the way that Dickens uses this with Afri, I mean, she it's very similar in that she is very worried that there are, that this is a haunted house, that things are going on, and you know, we're in the realm of Dickens, which is realism, but there are you know things that happen that are very extreme, and so so I feel like Gaslight is is 
is pretty Dickensian. A lot of people did compare, I should point out, I didn't mention this, but Patrick Hamilton, especially in his novels, people call him Dickensian over and over and over again, because he's really, he's very much writing about um, urban London life, Patrick Hamilton, even though he's also writing about uh, men who become murderers because they're so mad. He, he, I would say some of these novels that he writes would be what we would call like incel culture. They're like men who are obsessed with women. And then when they don't get to have the women, they go crazy and they kill people. And like, it's very brutal. And that's, you know, that's very different what the gaslighting plot is where it's really um, much more centered on the woman's perspective. But does that help answer the difference of what? Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. Thank you. And I see Patricia. Yeah, hi. Um, I only wanted to say that I see quite a lot of parallels with Dickens. I put a few comments in the chat, mm -hmm. but definitely Wilkie Collins. Yes, yes. Because the woman in white is right. so much like this. Yes. And it, if you read that in depth, it is not really supernatural. Right. You see so many things that might be. And if you right. walk down Avenue Road in South Hampstead or North St. John's Wood, yep. most nights you mm -hmm. will find exactly the same clock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, we are room. going to be talking about the woman in white in our introduction because it does feel like it's so on the nose. And I will say, and I read a lot of Patrick Hamilton's letters in the archives to try to see if I could connect more of his Victorianness. And he does mention that he loves Wilkie Collins. He doesn't say anything about Charles Dickens. And he also says that um, people went to see his play, like I think it was like Noel Coward went to see Gaslight and they said, this would make Robert Louis Stevenson proud because it has, it does have some Dr. Jekyll and Hyde with the, the hidden door and so forth. So that, I think that's really the vibe he was going for, but he was a big fan of Wilkie Collins and you can feel it because it is that kind of, it does feel like this is uh, certainly related to sensation fiction as a genre too, the, the, what Gaslight is. I think that you can really see the connections, but yes, thank you for that. Cause, and it makes me really want to go to London and walk the streets in the middle of the night and hope that I get to see something that feels like it's a ghost and then not. Sounds fabulous. John, I'll see your hand. Yes, thanks for this uh, great uh, teaser of uh, about the very interesting book that you're editing and co-editing. Um, in your uh, short biography of, of Patrick Hamilton, one of the things you mentioned was that in his own life, uh, the, the, the gender relationship that is involved sometimes involves or often involves uh, a young man who is vulnerable to uh, a manipulative woman. But I'm wondering about cases where the manipulator and the victim might be of the same gender, the same sex. And is there a tradition uh, of gaslighting that follows either of those lines? Well, what I would point you to for that is, have you read Carmen Maria Machado's? She has her her, um, her autobiography. It's, it is an autobiography. I don't think it's even like a loosely, but she actually, it's called, oh gosh, I read it a few years ago. Does anyone remember? In the, in the Dream House, maybe? I think it's called In the Dream House, where she explicitly, first of all, she cites Gaslight in it, and she talks about her version, uh, like how, so basically the whole idea is that she takes different genres, but she's a lesbian and it's about her relationship where she was in an abusive, domestic abuse uh, relationship with her former partner. And it really is saying like, these kinds of abuses are not just for heterosexual couples. And like, so she really, and she does actually use the term gaslighting. And so I think that that is um, an example that comes to mind of somebody who said, you know, it was maybe, 10 years ago or so, so it's like fairly recent, but it was saying like, let's stop pretending like this is something that the, where the power dynamic is always men doing it to women. That being said, I do think that we're, in our book, we're talking almost exclusively about men who are male characters or, or real men who are gaslighting women. And I think that's because Victorian literature is much more interested in that dynamic. And so when there are times for sure where there's abuses that go the other direction, but would we call them gaslighting? And, and I think it's, we were hard pressed to think of examples in Victorian literature where what, and, and I will say that when Patrick Hamilton, when he wrote those books where it's the, the poor victimized man, I wouldn't call those gaslighting books. Those are definitely like, he loses his mind, these male characters kind of 
go crazy, but they do so because they're so it's, you know, the power structure is so different that it's not like these women are trying to drive them crazy or doing things. It's just that they're so madly in love with them and they can't have them. So it makes them go mad. So I wouldn't say that he kind of does different gendered variations on the gaslighting theme, but I do think that you're absolutely right to point out that yes, in, in real life and in, and in literature, it is there when, when we have same sex gaslighting, but I just think that it's, relatively rare i think in the victorian era they were just they used this particular type of manipulation to show kind of gendered power structures over and over and over again so that's what we really are mainly seeing when we're when we're looking back on it if that answers your question yeah that that helps um the it's a stretch but the example that was hovering in the, in the back of my mind was um uriah heaps mesmeric mm -hmm. powers uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes manipulate David um, in David Copperfield, but that's definitely true. And I will say this: that Kate Abramson just wrote a book on, uh, and I think it was Renee asked me before this time why, or somebody was asking why is there so much? Uh, are there so many articles on gaslighting right now? You might have noticed that there was one in the New Yorker recently. There was one in the New York Times, and the reason for that, there is an actual reason, is that Kate Abramson is a philosopher who wrote an article, maybe like. 10 years ago called Turning Up the Lights on Gaslighting, um, but she she transformed it into a full book and it's, it just came out from Princeton University Press. It's just called On Gaslighting. And in that she gets very, what, what reminded me of what you just said, John, was that she's very concerned with people applying the term gaslighting to when it's quote, just manipulation or it's just being mesmeric. And so she's like, it needs to have certain layers of you're, you're manipulating someone specifically. I don't know if I totally agree with her. I think we can use it how we find it used. I, I understand that you can overuse a term and it loses its meaning. But I also think that some of the examples that she gives in her book of things that she wouldn't call gaslighting, I kind of would. So, but, but so I, I'm not as uh, persnickety perhaps about that as she is. But I think she would say in that case, like that feels like it's not quite it certainly has, it's all it's all cast light adjacent, shall we say, but is it actually that he's um, using his power to try to destabilize um, another character's sense of reality to the point where that person will lose their their mind, you know what I mean? So um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, you could open it up. I kind of would love it if somebody wrote further books on this and did things like more thinking about, um, are there ways that we can think about um, men being gaslit by men, men being gaslit by women, and, and it opening it up. But we found that Victorian literature as a whole loves to talk about men gaslighting women. So that is what we focused on. Yeah. Someone in the chat, um, Julia Stern, brought up um, Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca as another example of a um, yep. of a woman gaslighting gaslighting a woman. And yes. the, you know, and I feel like that novel is maybe a really interesting one to think about how, like, how power dynamics are working in that in that gaslighting world. Yes, definitely. When I teach my gaslighting class, I start with gaslight, and the next thing we watch is Rebecca, and then we watch um, the gaslight noir because I do think Tanya Modleski said this in the eighties. She said that the gaslight noir genre it started with Rebecca and Gaslight, the nineteen forty four version, and then from those two we kind of created this genre. Um, so absolutely, I think that's crucial. It was, I will admit, when I used to give when I did my own version of the introduction that was one of the texts that I wanted to look at um and we it didn't make the cut because we we're just trying to do so much and it felt like let's try to limit it just to Victorian actually Victorian text but I love talking about Rebecca in in connection with this because it is absolutely I mean it is her Mrs. Danvers trying to get her to go crazy to commit suicide. I mean, it really is intense psychological manipulation. Um, and of course, I'd like the fact that Daphne du Maurier is connected to George du Maurier, who wrote Trilby. There's all kinds of connections. And also that Rebecca came out, the novel, right in 1930, right when Gaslight, the play, was being written. So probably Patrick Hamilton, it was like Rebecca was all the rage while he was writing this play. So I feel like that makes me feel like he, whether he wants to admit that he was uh, influenced by it or not, I feel like it clearly was uh, in the ether at the time when he was writing Gaslight. So that's important to connect. So thank you for pointing that out, which I love to talk about. And then I see Deborah raising her hand. 
Yeah, sorry, I was just distracted by what was going on in the chat as well, because I think uh, one of one of, one of the, the, the key difficulties is actually pinning down what is meant by the term gaslighting. And I mean, because you just indicated previously that you, you would want something more than just manipulation. I mean, obviously, manipulation is is quite a, a, a deleterious thing on its own, but it's for something more. So, I mean, when when you conceive of gaslighting in terms of this book that you're producing, do you have a definition where it in where it? I mean, intrinsic to the definition of gaslighting is this need to exert some sort of element of control. Um, yeah. So more than just manipulation, more than just deception, but th this questioning of sanity as part of a coercive approach to controlling a partner within an intimate relationship, for example. Absolutely. That is that is crucial to it. And I feel like, again, today it was hard. I didn't want to get part of what our answer is, the way we define gaslighting is you have to know this full text. And so we need to spell out some of the dynamics, the, the subtler dynamics of the text. Um, certainly what you're saying is 100% there, that it's he's trying to control her for a very specific reason. But you, but we want it to be that like, you know, you can, the, the gaslighting text is, all, you know, it's a two hour long play or movie. There are so many different layers to it. And to us, those are all different elements of gaslighting that don't get picked up in just a one sentence definition of the term. Do you know what I mean? And so we feel like, what what's so cool about this is that you really have to give a whole play's worth or film's worth to understand what this thing is. Um, but at that being said, there's some fundamentals to it. And certainly the idea of somebody trying to control somebody else that they want to um, create, if, if they destabilize what that person's sense of self and reality is, it get, they, uh, you know, they benefit from it somehow. They get something out of it. It can be very different things. And they have to be, like, it doesn't really work if the, the you know, there has to be a power imbalance to it. So that the, the one person who has some some kind of power, and we talk a lot about institutional um, gaslighting in our, in our book. So the idea that, and you, obviously interpersonal is what this text is about, but I do think it makes sense to think about how do power structures of racial hierarchies and, um, you know, institutions like marriage, the institution, how do these things, you know, work to help individuals gaslight because they give them certain power that uh, that other people don't have and, and that imbalance is where you have to be able to convince someone that their whole way of thinking of things is wrong and it's hard to do that if you're in the, the disempowered position do you know what I mean so but yeah I think that it's all I, we're, I don't think we're going to come up with a one sentence definition through our book we're going to kind of say it's complicated and and read the whole uh, watch the whole movie or read the whole play so that you can and frankly know all four of the ones that we're talking about so that you can fully understand it yeah are there things going I'm terrible about reading the chat and, and talking at the same time is there anything else that I'm supposed to be referring to answering or anything well Blair just mentioned a movie um called She Wolf of London that I don't um, know that Blair, I don't know. Would you would you mind talking a little bit more about that movie? Because I, that sounds like an amazing movie that I would like to know more about. Uh, yes, yeah, starring Angela Lansbury, I believe. And um, in it, she is, uh, I don't know if the term gaslit is correct. I, I'm not, not very good at that kind of thing. But anyhow, she is half convinced by her housekeeper. There's a, I'm giving it all away into believing that she is a werewolf and there are a series of murders that takes place in a foggy london town in the 1880s 1890s mm -hmm. um and it's uh, a lot of fun to watch and uh anyway it's a case i find it interesting that uh when hollywood decided that they were going to make a movie about somebody being gaslit that they set it in the uh, late 19th century. Um, yeah. Anyway, well, just, just another thought. No, thank you so much. I have not seen this movie and I absolutely love Angela Lansbury and I feel kind of heartbroken that I've never seen it, but now I'm totally going to go out and watch it because I love all movies that I would call that a neo-Victorian movie. What Do you know when it's from? Is it from the 18, I mean, 19... 50s, 60s, when? I guess, and I think it's Angela Lansbury. It's um, 1946. According uh, am I, Renee, am I correct about the actress? Is it um, 
It looks like it stars June Lockhart and Don Porter. Oh, June Lockhart. Okay, I'm sorry. My, oh, my... don't apologize. I need to see this movie. That's not, I, I wasn't in it just for the Angela Rams, right? Everything about that, I, I really want to, and I don't want to know whether it turns out that she's a werewolf or not. Let me be surprised. Okay, it's, it's <laughs> it fun. You'll good. enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. And I would say in terms of the, um, the the setting of 19th century London, in this case, Gaslight, the play, is definitely set in this time period, so they don't change it for the movies. But the um, Hangover Square that Patrick Hamilton, one of his probably his most famous novel, that's set in contemporary London. It was from the uh, 1940 or so. And they set that also in the Victorian because they were like, let's cash in on the Gaslight noir genre. So once Gaslight, the Hollywood movie, was so successful, Hollywood did do just what you're talking about they would just put all these movies let it set there was some quote from a critic said oh if we're going to have a spooky thriller we have to set it in gaslit london because that's all anybody wants to watch anymore so it really became kind of like a a temporary craze and right in the post-world war ii moment and so um part of what i want to do in a different article is really think about that dynamic and it, almost all of them have to do with mental illness sometimes it's the the man who is going crazy sometimes the woman but they're all like kind of these the 19th century will drive you insane stories over and over again, yeah. But thank you for that. That is that it? If we don't have any other questions, we can move on or and, and if anybody i mean the thing is is we're going to have if you come back for the next session we're going to get to talk about the movie version but i would definitely love for you to talk about any um other texts that you can think of where where victor where gaslighting seems to be happening and um you know whether or not you 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 do think that this 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 uh 1944 film captures the Victorian era well, or you all are experts in Dickensian literature. So what do you feel like they are getting right and getting wrong? And um, and and just kind of, and if you do watch both versions, you need to vote on which one you think is better. Because um, I personally have such a prejudice for Ingrid Bergman as an actress that I absolutely love her performance in this. But I see, I also love Anton Walbrook. I will point out if you know the movie, The Red Shoes, this was one of my favorite movies as a little kid. And he is the Svengali figure in The Red Shoes is uh, Anton Walbrook, who is the the uh, husband in the British version. So he's by far, I think, the best part of the British version. But um, yeah, you could watch both if you are so inclined. And Nora, do you know um, if if any folks want to want to read the play, like if anyone wants to do, oh. you know, a deep dive, is it um, is it available online? Sort of. Uh, so I don't know about probably, but here's the thing that I warn you is that you won't get the original version, right? Is that you will a lot of times they put Angel Street. We've now done this all this trying to track them down. You'll get close, and I mean you probably will care less than we do. But some of the things, and I'll tell you what they are next time, where they really change the plot. Um, what really happened is the 1940 British film came out, and then the Angel Street changed a whole lot of things to be more like the movie is what really happened, we think. But so the point is, yes, you can look up Gaslight or Angel Street and they'll they play versions that you can either um, get from your library or you can order a cheap copy and they will be close. They will not be perhaps exactly like, and I'm, I don't think the actual original version is out there anywhere. We have tried and tried, but I'll tell you what we think we know about it from the that, that MGM document next time after you've watched the movie. <laughs> awesome. I can't wait to hear that. Like, is it book history if it's a play? Just no, the... No. The, the the theater play history. Yeah, no, it's really it's really interesting and a little frustrating. We were so hoping we would uncover this original edition, and we have not been able to do it. It really seems to have vanished, which is disappointing. But yeah. Oh, Patricia. Very last comment because I have to admit, I am an ignoramus. I did not even know this term existed apart from lighting lamps in Victorian uh -huh. London. Uh -huh. But now that you've explained it so brilliantly, I suggest as someone who reads massive amounts of Anthony Trollope, uh -huh. that there yeah. is so much in so many of his novels uh -huh. that those of you who are interested in exploring it in more detail beyond Dickens, mm -hmm. where there is plenty. But I think in some ways there's even more in Trollope. Yeah, 
No, that's a great point. We when we we wanted there to be all the things and we were kind of hoping like we as as the editors, we were like, we hope somebody will send us a submission on so and so and so and so. And we were kind of hoping for a trial of submission, but we didn't get any and we had already figured out where we so that didn't make the cut this time, but but you are correct. And I think that I hope that people will keep thinking more and more about how all these other places in Victorian literature were so relevant. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Well, and thank you so much, Nora. Well, and I'm Courtney, I'm going to leave because it's now past 10 o'clock here. So oh, yes. Well, good night. Yes. Thank you for coming. I wish I were there. I'm jealous. Courtney, what's the date of Nora's May discussion? Oh, um, I should know this off the top of my head. Um, it is May, May, May 19th. 19th. May yes. 19th. Wonderful. Well, let's thank Nora for this wonderful talk. And we are so excited about rejoining on May 19th to talk about the movie when we can not worry about spoilers and all I these things. I will talk much more about these details next time. Yes, yes. And, right. and very quickly, um, we're going to be sending out a link uh, so you can watch the um, the film. You can stream it from, from the Dickens Project um, streaming service. So um, you can probably rent it online with Amazon or Apple, um, but but we'll be sending you out a, a link um, for the 1944 version. So it's really nice that they did that so that it's really easy to access. So thank you, Courtney, for doing that. Thank you so much, Nora, and everybody enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Bye.